it doesn't grow. So as you can see, gold's the toughest one. It's the one that fights you all the way down to the monotonic stage. It doesn't help you one bit. No slack granite here. Iridium, all you gotta do is get it below nine and just heat it and cool it, heat it and cool it, and it comes apart all on its own. Okay? Now it's real interesting, when the man from Engelhart Industry evaluated our work, he said, gosh, this explains so many things we can't understand. At Engelhart, when we actually bring iridium scrap back to our factory from the jewelry industry and we try re-refining the iridium, we cannot guarantee over an 86% recovery on the iridium. 14% is lost in the processing. Yet when we get gold, we get 99.9% .9 recovery on it. Well, the reason is you will never disaggregate gold to the monotonic state in any normal processing. And so it always recovers, 100%. But iridium, when you get below 9 amp clusters, it comes all apart. And so in the dissolution of the iridium, much of it does happen to get below 9 amp clusters. And so they lose 14%. And he says, gosh, that explains why we can't process iridium well. By platinum and rhodium, we get about 97% recovery. With gold, we get 100% virtually. And that's why. It isn't lost in the processing. So what they're doing is they're dumping 14% of the iridium down the drain. They don't know where it went. It's still a solution. It won't come back. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Then one other reference that I think is real important, and for these people interested in the, in the physics, we need to get right down to the bottom of it. The last sentence here. For many molecular and polymeric glasses, the glass transition temperature less absolute zero temperature is only about 40 to 60 degrees Kelvin. In other words, absolute zero, no temperature at all, there's only about 40 degrees Kelvin between absolute zero and the temperature of the glass. So what they're saying is the glass is cold, that the internal temperature of the glass is very, very cold. And you don't have to take that much temperature out of it before it's absolute zero. Okay? It's real important to understand that, that the internal temperature of the atom has nothing to do with the outside temperature. Even though it's sitting here at room temperature, 350 or 360 degrees Kelvin, that has nothing to do with the internal temperature of the atom. The atom is totally a world all its own. Let's go to the last slide here. Here is a reference when you understand that in fact in a metal, the temperature, depending on the metal, is somewhere between 350 and 375 degrees Kelvin. It's pretty darn hot in a metal. When you disaggregate the metal to smaller and smaller cluster size, in fact, you are lowering the internal bound temperature of the system. There actually are researchers over in Italy who actually measure the phonon frequency of energy being shared between the nucleus and the electron, and they find that that wavelength gets longer and longer and longer, the smaller and smaller the particle size becomes. And actually, they, they actually hear our specific example. Here is potassium, which is K2, diatomic potassium, and its internal temperature is about 90 to 100 degrees at 10 millibars pressure. But at 1 millibar pressure, it's about 110 degrees. The trimer of sodium is about 100 degrees, and the dimer of sodium is about, about 40 to 50 degrees. So as you can see, the trimer is hotter than the dimer, from there to there. Well, they can't find the monomer, but it should be somewhere down in here, approaching absolute zero. But they can't find it to measure it. They don't know how to, how to see it. They try to find it, and they can't find it. Well, the problem is they really can't produce it readily. So as you disaggregate the metal by chemistry, you're actually cooling the metal down. Okay, this is an article out of uh, Scientific American, March 1990. It's called New Radioactivities. Now, I'm going to say this again, like I said before. I'm not trying to teach you nuclear physics, people. What I want you to see is the date. I want you to see who published it. I want you to see the credentials. And we will read a few excerpts out of it. But I'm not trying to teach you nuclear physics because this isn't what this is about. This is about seeing as a confirmation of when we filed our patent and what's going on. This article called New Radioactivities is all about studying the nucleus. And here they have these harmonic sequences of protons and neutrons depicted like, kind of like a bullseye. They found out that the protons and neutrons fill in the nucleus just like the electrons fill. Remember the electron orbitals they taught you in chemistry class? There's two 
8, 8, 16. There's actually harmonic sequences. It goes 1, 2, and then that one's filled, and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and that one's filled. Start the next one. Well, the nucleus fills in the same way. The protons and neutrons are actually quantum oscillators, and they fill in harmonic sequences. So they fill same note occupier, same note occupier. They fill in harmonic sequences. And they depict these here as, as, as little rings. So you got it here, you got it here, you got it here. They, this fill is coming out. Okay? That's what this is depicting, is proton and neutron configuration. Let's go to the next slide. Now, this is the left-hand side of the page. This other page is the right-hand side. And here, what we're depicting is the uranium-232, its proton and neutron orbitals begin to deform. Then it becomes severely deformed, and then it pops apart into neon-24 and lead-208, two different elements. Now, when this was first observed, by the nuclear physicists who are capable of working with a single atom, there was no alpha, no beta, and no gamma emission. And this was not the nuclear physics they expected to see. Anytime you get fission, there is also always alpha, beta, or gamma emission. One, sometimes a combination. But when this happened, there was no alpha, beta, or gamma emission. And the nuclear physicist said, whoa, what happened here? It was uranium-232, now it's lead and Neon, where'd it come from? How'd it happen? This is the way it's supposed to be. So anyway, what we need to read here is basically, this is really critical to this whole understanding, is this basic information here. It is now known that the atomic nucleus is a more or less spherical object whose diameter is about a few fermis, or a unit of measure equal to one quadrillionth of a meter, or simply 10 to the minus 15th meters. In other words, it's very, 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 very tiny. For comparison, the radius of the moon's orbit is only about 30 times greater than the diameter of the Earth. So what they're trying to show you is, you know, here's the Earth and here's the moon, and here's the itty tiny nucleus and a huge electron cloud around it. It's nowhere near the size of this nucleus. The electron cloud is immense compared to the size of this tiny little nucleus. It says, packed in this Fermi-sized nucleus is nearly all the mass of an atom and all of its positive electric charge. The mass of the nucleus comes mainly from nucleons, and protons carry the positive charge. Okay, no big deal. It's what we were taught in school. The structure of the nucleus arises from two types of inner reactions, the strong and the electromagnetic. And as a result of the strong inner reaction of the nuclear force, protons bind to neutrons and to each other. So this is the glue the strong force, the glue. The nuclear force binds nucleons very tightly but acts over a very short range. To separate two neutrons that are one Fermi apart, for instance, requires an energy of about one million electron volts. Now, everything so far is exactly the way we were taught in school. No problems. Everything just the way we were taught. But it says, on the other hand, only about 10 electron volts is needed to disassociate two nucleons that are 10 Fermis apart. Now, this is where the situation changes people. It only takes 10 electron volts to cause these nuclear particles to come apart if they're deformed. Now, as a result of the electromagnetic inner reaction, or the Coulomb force, protons repel other protons. Although the Coulomb force is weaker than the nuclear force, it acts over a much longer range. So if two protons are one Fermi apart, the Coulomb force is about 100 times weaker than the nuclear force. Yet at a distance of 10 Fermis, the Coulomb force is about 10 times stronger than the nuclear force. So what this is saying is that little weak force isn't very strong, the one that tries to push the nucleus apart, until it gets a little bit deformed. And when it gets the least little bit deformed, the glue quits working. And then the force that's trying to push them apart blows them apart. It didn't say it needed any help at all. It says it blows itself apart. Now this isn't the world we were taught in school. The nucleus is supposed to be a very stable thing. It takes millions of electron volts to rip it apart, and here we're talking about one coming apart all on its own. Sounds like alchemy. Okay, let's go to the next one.